which will be very practical, very good. I would like to thank Confama, Metropolitan Area of Medellin, Mobiliario of Nica, Replay, Camohop. We here have Camilo representing Camohop. Obviously, ASDF. And the circular economy platform, obviously. In this panel, we will touch on the subject on how circular economy helps see development of cities. Every panel we've had so far, what we've seen in them are concepts, what orange economy means. Now, because it's the second time I've heard about orange economy, how to take that information down to everyday life. I'm a simple human being, everyday life guy, and not genius like you guys here. So how does all of this impact, truly impact orange economy for, how does it impact circular economy in the development of uh, cities and people? So here we have four uh, entrepreneurs who have lived this out, and I would like you to share your experiences. The first thing I would like us to talk about, even though we've talked about this all day, is to uh, talk about circular economy baseline concept. To start off there, for those who are listening to us, on why those concepts are on the table. First one is, why are we talking about circular economy? The United Nations talks about it, planet leaders. Why are we doing this? Because the UN and academic leaders notice that we are consuming uh, natural resources at a faster rate than the planet can produce them. We talked about sustainable development and notice that that concept falls short. We need to take an extra step. And this is where the concept of circular economy is born. Also, some objectives of sustainable development. Every time they meet to see how those objectives of, so of sustainable development are being met, we see that things are not moving forward at the levels and the speed that needs to move. So we're seeing where can we go and what can we do? And why is the name circular economy and not other? Because for it to be a, a cross-cutting, cross-section cut uh, for uh, every country to impact economy because everyone needs to have a sustainability and continue developing their economical activity. So it is important to continue to do this, impacting the, in the, less the planet in the less aggressive way as possible. Uh, it would be best if we would have zero impact, but since that's not possible, then the less possible. So this is in the concept this basic baseline concept part of what we're why we're talking about this so it's clear that we need to do it that we all need to implement circular economy and migrate towards that but how will we do this and the first step in all of us uh, agree in this is culture and education the consumer has a very large amounts of power. So the purchase decision of that consumer will generate uh, an environmental impact. If I'm not interested in generating uh, shark fins, then they will not fish sharks anymore. If I'm no longer interested in purchasing fur coats, then they will no longer, the industry will no longer kill those animals to get the fur for those coats. We will continue generating industry, but let us teach the consumer that his and hers, his and her decision uh, choice, purchase, consuming choices will affect the industry. 
and we also need to look at how the industry needs to re rethink itself. I, fab I manufacture these types of tables. How can I make so this table, when its shelf life is done, it can be biodegradable, composted, it can have a second usage, it can serve as a uh, floor. The concept, the design concept of products change and the consumer power as well so that he questions in his consumer choices because many people when they choose these types of products they make the product the market to continue generating them what happens if a cell phone manufacturer creates a, a post-consumption plan to uh, recover the unused cell phone and to recover the minerals the metals in it and we're not talking about ending the industry dividing it because we will always want to seek the economy to grow for governments so the question is how do we reduce that consumption of natural resources and that the ones being cons uh, consumed are done if so efficiently how do we generate culture and how will we do it from the planning of territory and we will continue talking about this you were talking about orange economy which also converges with overlaps and complement or complement of circular economy because what circular economy is saying is don't focus in a product generate a service that's where orange economy says look you can generate a lot of services that will always generate income that will also uh, make the economy uh, flow and the environment change bringing this down to earth because these are still concepts i would like you to tell us what you have done in real life because one would think circular economy to turn it in practical terms and money for an entrepreneur i will take 10 15 years i don't want to take that long but you have done it in very short time I would like you to tell us and the people watching from Peru, from Mexico, from Chile, obviously from Colombia, the Caribbean islands as well. We have good, good audience. So I would like you to tell us what you have done in practical terms and how to truly work with circular economy, whether it is, whether whether it is affordable and it brings and gives jobs to people and is it profitable i direct con escombros a beautiful uh, company which is a uh, residue recovery and uh, and refreshing company for building materials we're talking about uh we're talking about circular economy in the industry of construction for conesco it is a company that based on the waste in construction and demolition that arrived into the plant it goes through a classification uh, process through which we make materials we get materials that are 100 percent recyclable recyclable so we are producing materials with a lower carbon footprint that partially replace the demand of natural aggregates the circularity for regeneration of um, waste the reuse reusage of mining exploitation third we lower the carbon footprint and for they are reinserted into the uh, industrial chain this is why it's a circular economy it, we do all the turnaround so for us to understand what a circular economy is let's say what would the linear would be the linear is the traditional mo model we exploit natural resources those material resources are turned into materials for construction those are used in construction then there's waste from that and at the end the when the uh when the construction is no 
longer uh, viable, it is demolished, and there's waste. But you, we say, wait, the waste at the end of line has potential to be reused. Secondly, we can develop products from that waste, which are also quality products, also uh, products which are have value, and makes that what was linear now turns into a circle and impacts the in the chain. What's the advantage for a constructor constructor who wants to consume these aggregates? It it means for him no uh, no overcost, no extra logistics. Materials has a development process that allow for more techniques to abide by, and not even the price is a barrier because the, the location of the plant is strategic. So this circular process can be taken to any type of industry because the company, the company was founded to give the solution to the actors in the construction sector and infrastructure. But in any type of industry, we can do the same analysis to look at how one company discards can be useful for another. But they, we, can, we, we need to have those two industries to talk with each other and communicate with open lines. Those are steps down the line. But the normative framework regulatory framework facilitates these types of interactions. This is a case of success that's very nice in the metropolitan area here in Medellin. But there are many cases of success around the world and we want to start looking at how more and more companies, each more, each time more uh, companies and industries migrate to circular economy and valued by the consumer. This is why this is why flip-flops are being manufactured with recycled plastic from the oceans. Can I, can I make a comment on what uh, you're saying regarding the construction chain? My name is Alejandro from Brazil. And I work with the idea of connecting the actors. You ask us to bring this down to earth. And reality is that the productive chain, production chain of buildings, for example, the city, is nothing circular. Everything is linear. Regulations, materials, construction systems, architects, engineers think in a linear way. They they jog down a project. They know they will it will have a waste. Uh, and they will not change the project in spite of that. There's a whole force of a linear system that's been going on for over two, three hundred years of industrial revolution. Now we have a lot of uh, damaged waste because of that. And because it's linear, it's not sustainable. It's not possible to continue under this system even though it brings a lot of good things for us we're here because of internet uh, for the world but not in a linear system and this is when we call the actors and we want to look at the relationships the relations education how to market the construction building for example the product how we value things how people f feel empowered with the product all of this needs to change. How do we change something that's this big and an entrepreneur uh, gets into this linear system to do something circular? It's a lot of effort. It takes a lot of effort. It's a lot of research, a lot of technology, a lot of marketing and talking, talking, talking with people, convincing them that this is better. It's, it's a lot. So I believe this is the point we need to dig into. There are three large groups. I work in Brazil with advocacy in circular economy since 2012. I've been there. I was involved in translating the Creed to Creed book for Brazil. I signed the preface, so I'm very proud that I've been in this since the beginning. And we think, how did we begin? With this, with education, yes. 
and we need to talk with small businesses, small and medium businesses, because they are the ones who will uh, potentially make a change, the most idealistic ones, and they will talk with the architects, in, architect group in Brazil, because they were open, and this was the beginning of our work in 2012. At the beginning, it was just talking with different actors, feeling where circular economy was going for countries like Brazil, which is completely different from Europe, right? For, for like those in Netherlands, England, it's, it's not the same. It, we don't have the same value. It's very different. We're now involved in trying to understand in 2019, after so much effort, we're now making advocacy, talking with academia, with the industry, with government. And for the first time, there's an idea of establishing a roadmap for circular economy in Brazil. What's a roadmap? It's a challenge roadmap on where we are, where are we going? Planning the vision where we are, where we're going, planning who will be involved who is important to get involved and bring the people in, talk with them and bring out of them the value of circular economy. Circular economy is not an entity, is an engagement. It's a new engagement for everything you want. How will you engage it? How will you engage what's possible to be engaged? This is my contribution for this beginning. Alex, I would like to uh, take advantage of uh, Lenny's intervention and Mauricio's is that the metropolitan area as an entity not only understands what the uh, linear model um, of production is, post Ford uh, focused in the accumulation of materials and services, but those two variables also have an ex extraction, extractivist model and mainly in emerging economies such as Mexico, Colombia, Brazil, we still depend on raw materials. So it is very clear to, that Latin American Caribbean has very clear in this space that not only the economies in transformation, including the orange uh, economy, blue economy, green economy, and circular economy, these economies have entered into a tendency that comes from the uh, demand of the behavior itself. So we need to have educational, cultural, and social effective components in the territory, but we need to have clear actions to bring these facts down to earth so it is not left in dialectics as, as it happens today. So that what happens today, for example, with orange economy, which is a creative economy since the year 2004, and the impact of circular economy on that model of creative economy within the framework of the new industrial revolution, which is really important, is that while we are adjusting to uh, AI, blockchain, the internet of things, big data, we already have um, power countries such as China and the United States um, implying a, uh, applying a monopoly of the 4G. So we need to see that every five years there's a new paradigm to understand. This is the first insight. This is not only an invitation to change the way we relate to each other, but also the way to consume, but also the way on how information flows. It's not only understanding that information is re not relevant to the one who has it, but to the one who knows how to use it. And in this uh, no era of knowledge, this era of uh, knowers, as Oppenheimer said, has the strength of knowing that it came to the end of a cycle, the small universe we have in this uh, earth, and that this demand from the nature of mankind makes the circular economy model to be necessary and a prerequisite to continue the commitment for future generations, which is one of the 
baselines that any territorial actor needs to have to satisfy our population's needs and co and commit to the following generations as well. Understanding the concept of ecosystem, because cities are not islands, the territory is a whole ecosystem with rivers, with mountains, with an, a, a road infrastructure, with human beings and a culture, and the functioning of that ecosystem needs to be holistic. In that, the governance of Medellin and other organizations uh, uh, have acted, and you have seen it in the transformation of Medellin in the last 25 years, how uh, the transportation uh, has radically changed in Medellin, how with $1.5 in the metro line system you can uh, you can go from end to end of the uh, Aburra Valley in Medellin. So going back to the dialectics of public policies, it's very important to understand that as governments, we are joining a cha into a challenge that is impacting the territory. For example, Slendy represents a sector of construction that is seen as uh, traditional. And we understand the concept of sustainability. We understand that our ecosystem is important. This is what we've called metropolitan intelligent ecosystem. But that ecosystem also needs to understand that it needs to demand new constructors to commit to the new norms of uh, energy uh, sustainability. So we've been working with Ecomobility, with C40, and other entities such as the UN. When we have a diagram here, I don't know if you can transmit it uh, in order to understand the production circular uh, production model. If I can make a comment on this, this is a model that's been done because I'm a friend of an architect that works at a regional scale, Exocatoni from Brazil. He works the connection at diverse levels, diverse schemes, a framework with which I can think, for example. Because the thing is, circular economy, red economy, black economy, whichever economy, they all have challenges, which is sustainable development. This is what we really want. How can we communicate these ideas to develop this effectively. Yes. Uh, yes, let me finish uh, this section on this diagram so we understand something that's uh, crucial. Uh, crucial on the 21 principles of sustainable development. Four of them have to do with biosphere. Eight of them have a focus on economy and the others are focused on society. The last one is the obje the seventeenth objective on development, which are uh, uh, which are partnerships. If you look at it, uh, as a pyramid, as a hierarchy of priority, if our biosphere is not right, which is what's happening today, this is why what you say is more than a reality. This is not a tendency. This is the earth and human beings, and the consumption model and corporate people, entrepreneurs demanding this. If biosphere is not well, then the society won't be well. So the basic uh, thing to understand, understanding that the city is a system of systems constantly in constant communication, this is where the circular economy makes a paradigm change in human beings of interrelationship. And last insight for us to continue here, is maybe the new era of the fourth uh, revolution in a transition to the fifth where you, there might be a global loss of 75 million jobs but it will generate 129 million jobs and what will these 20, 129 million jobs uh, participate in and what will they generate and circular economy is key in this so i will begin without uh, repeating what was said because we understand what the key issues are i will go only mention three key elements in order to understand what we need to do today to make decisions at a, a city level 
at a, a business model levels is a uh, or company level it's a sense of urgency climate change is not something we believe or don't believe it's something that's happening and decisions need to be taken right away which ones the ones oriented to generating a value change in economical prosperity and orientation second uh, e circular economy is not philanthropy is not volunteering it's a matter of business because if there is no business behind it we cannot aspire to any type of growth at any scale we can generate business those 129 million how will they be generated if there's no economical system that uh, supports it and finally if we're thinking in a fourth or fifth revolution if we're talking about new elements uh, into the current productive system, new models, new products, new services, new ways of consumption. It is incredible that we continue putting the word uh, innovation aside when it needs to be the center. If I'm saying I need to recon, if I'm saying I need to reconfigure, redesign, obviously I need to innovate. I need to think differently. Ken was saying this morning, we need to change the way we view things. So if we want to change. The problem we saw today doing the same but with different toys we know the result it won't happen using the same toys so i believe that as long as we don't understand where we want to go as a territory it will be very difficult to take the right decisions for example latin american cities are thought under a linear economy and under a consumption mobility model that is not sustainable neither medellin nor city of mexico at whatever scale, from 1 million to 20, 25 million. They're not designed for that. So if we don't uh, re rethink this future, this uh, city, the plan, how will I use the new information today, like big data or the new business models that will give opportunity to materials to truly build this prosperity and this well-being for people? Because as Nicola says, and I think he'll repeat it tomorrow, if everything we do is not focused in generating happiness, quality of life and well-being, we're losing our, wasting our time. For me, it's that simple. Very well. You can explain the diagram now because I think you're burning for it. This diagram we're showing here on the screen connects many of the subjects that are important. When you talk about circular economy, in a way it changes the boundaries of, of the city, of the urban area in a way. You start thinking about something much bigger, production chains not linear ones of one sector, but many different production chains that are in interaction. Perhaps even global production chains but that have a local impact. So the administration of resources for a city. Why is a city so important for circular economy? Because you have diversity there. You have public administration, which can set goals and regulate efforts and start educating for this as well. This is already happening in some cities which are pioneers, for example, Medellin. Circular economy is telling us not just to look at the geographical political boundaries, but also economical boundaries, economic boundaries. It's not just exchange of goods and benefits and livelihood and improvement in quality of life. There are some of the elements, the new urban agenda of the UN, the sustainable development goals, circularity, circular economies for industries and for cities. So those are some of the elements, smart cities as well, new technologies and Industry 4.0 and ICTs. These are all elements that we need to combine them to be able to take all this to action. We need to be able to, because who, who are we, who are we, whose happiness are we working for? More employee uh, employment opportunities for whom?
are we going to extract res resources from here and capital here to increase the wel welfare of people somewhere else, right? We need to start thinking about circular economy for our local regions to change tendencies locally and replace them for other ones that are more appropriate. Uh, as you've mentioned, the interconnectivity in Brazil, for example, we have this idea of sustainable development by regions connecting, in a way, the different cell city Sina cells. That has been one of our success stories. I talk about urban development and city development and the international projection that our valley has had. We've understood, when I say we, Originally, I mean Antioquia, the whole department, we understood the importance of public circularity in public policies, especially in countries like ours where demagogues are very, very common, where we have polit politics that are not very inclusive or not very socially impactful. And from the optic of local governments, what we did was we coordinated a virtuous circle that allows us to be more successful. Medellin is the third most densely populated city in the world. We're talking about about 19,000 citizens per square mile, per square kilometer. And there's, there's no chance for Latin American economies who were designed based on a linear model to be successful today because we have 19,000 individuals per square kilometer. And we have to understand that our valley has lost its, we've transcended our um, carrying capacity. When you arrived in the airport, you realize that uh, it's very, this is a huge challenge that we have because we also need to understand that today we need to reduce space and time, as Emmanuel Waller says, in terms of ter increasing efficiency and reducing costs, but besides producing space and replacing by time, we need to re replace the impact on energy consumption, which means energy. The circular economy and the production model that I want to highlight, it's like, a, it's an, like an umbrella. All the economies that will exist from now on, regardless of the color that they're named for, have to have a circular model of production. That has to be the umbrella that embraces all different production models, from the fabrication of a brick to the manufacturing of fabrics or services or goods sold throughout the internet or the manufacturing of a, of a cell phone. I believe that the challenge is huge. We've done great things. We have a great matrix in this territory. So what you're saying to me, let me see if I understand. Be, being and feeling a little bit ignorant, by the way, because of what you say, what I can understand is this. This is what I conclude. What you're saying, Alex, is that um, this works like a cluster, right? Joining the dots, being able to join the different hubs to be able to have a constellation as you mentioned. Let's say that we agree that. And the, let's say the metropolitan area and the entrepreneurs already understand and agree on that. So how can we change 300 years of linear cities? How do we change the business man or woman's mindset? And this is might say, well, I need people to buy from me constantly, not recycle goods, because then who will buy from me? And then another one that concerns me is how do we change politicians' mindset? Because this shift needs both sides. We need public policy and willingness as well from the business sector, which are the ones who create job opportunities and create welfare for for citizens. I would say that the first thing that we need to the first thing that we need to change 
to achieve the change that we want is to overcome fear. We need to tolerate uncertainty. If you don't assume risks, you will never win. If you have a sense of urgency and you are forced as a decision maker, wherever you are in the scale, you need to take risks. That's not an option. Otherwise, you, the risk will run you over. If we don't bet on innovation in 10 or 15 years, companies will probably die because they won't even have access to the raw materials that allow them to be profitable. So fear is, is really stopping decision makers from acting. So when I talk about innovation, going back to the first question you ask, how do we make take this into action? Companies need to learn from those who overcome fear and are taking decisions. For, exa for example, Mrs. Lendy company is a company that grew in a world where they have to take, be innovative and be entrepreneurial without resources. They have, they've had to be uh, like the pioneers. I come from the entrepreneurship world and innovation world and I assure you there are lots of startups today that can solve many of these challenges for the big companies, the linear companies, but they're terrified of doing something different. It's unbelievable that in February, uh, a commission of representatives from Northern European countries, Finland, Norway, Holland, going to different challenges, uh, showing us that they have an articulated system, both of startups and uh, even governments and embassies, offering to our countries the technologies that they've discovered. They even help us financially if, if we're willing how is it possible with all the talent that we have in Latin America, because we have it, all the technology tools that we have, and all the natural resources that we have, and all the help that they're offering us, we haven't been able to be brave enough to make a decision to go into action. That means we're afraid, afraid of losing our profitability in the short term. But you're not thinking about the long term. Another question. During lunch, we were talking about instead of fostering a huge change, try to foster a small change. Try to unite the different small changes to make a big one. Or to tr try to get other companies to feel envious and say, well, if that small company could do it, then we can as well. Well, out there on the field, you've lived this. How do you think we should go about this? Should we start with those micro habitats or micro uh, implementations of circular economy or let's just call for help from the government. We need your help and let's do something much bigger and widespread. That's, that's a good question. At what point of the scale or the system should we act first? Before I answer, uh, I want to make an important clarification. There are no magic recipes. If you look at the success examples of England or Edinburgh, their success stories might not be replicable here. Sometimes we try to imitate models. Just like our regulations are bad translations of foreign regulations, in our business models, we also are trying to imitate other people. We need to first interpret what has worked in different countries. We need to bring them to our local context. How can we do something equivalent, not identical, but it's applicable and aligned with our specific local context? In Latin America, we have abundant natural resources, for example. being surrounded by a biodiversity that is so beautiful makes people question the, the idea that we can, we have scarcity of resources here. And people from Africa would not understand how we use safe water to clean cars. We have so much water here that we can actually waste it cleaning our cars with it. So. 
So should I, where should I act first? Micro enterprise to the big enterprise. In my opinion, we need to act in every front at the same time. We'll do something here. We'll start sharing our success stories, but we also need to manage uh, at the macro level because I won't achieve much if I create a solution for a company if the legal framework prevents me to actually implement in the business model. So I need every, every single facet. In some countries, we mentioned that we mentioned that in some countries, uh, recycling is not fostered by the legal framework. So in, if in those countries you create uh, entrepreneurship that's geared towards recycling, the regulation will be opposing you. In the case of Colombia, we have many different regulations. Too much. We do have regulations and people don't know about them, don't know how to uh, comply with it. So I would say that we need to work on every front at the same time. Why is Latin America so important? Why are Europeans coming to, to Colombia and to Latin America to talk to us about it? Because there's this global phenomenon. More than 50% of all worldwide population is urban. Trends show that uh, rural populations are moving towards the cities. That means that there will be more urban pressure. There will be more demand for resources and basic necessities like mobility, transportation, um, utilities, infrastructure that will have to be covered somehow if we don't want uh, a social collapse to happen. So city planning, it's very important. Antioquia has been very, very good in understanding and anticipating that growth. That's what we are building, the Parques del Rio uh, infrastructure. People see it, they think it's only a mobility uh, solution to increase the public space, but really what they're doing there is they're renovating networks, increasing the installed capacity of sewers, uh, telecommunication uh, networks. That is called organized growth of the territory. They understood that we already live in a very dense, densely populated city. We're also trying to renovate the downtown and we're going to have a densification uh, downtown. What are we going to do about it? We're going to have to build uh, Parques del Rio to be able to generate the public utilities that will be able to service that. So we're basically planning ahead. Not all other cities are planned uh, anticipating uh, the demands of their citizens. So also understanding where we are, our cities, our culture, our tendencies is important. Another thing that I believe is very powerful is public transportation. Because if circular economy is seen as an umbrella, the handle of that umbrella has three components. It's uh, an alloy of three metals, environment, economy, and the social aspect. Transportation is very important for the social realm. It's very difficult to have good quality of life in a city where you take three hours to take to, you know, to make your commute from home to your job and then three hours back, right? And that happens in some cities, huge cities in the United States or in Mexico City as well. So thinking about uh, quality of life is also important. On the other hand, when public transportation is adequate and it's useful, people prefer it to having their private uh, vehicles. London is an example. London, Londoners prefer public transportation than to use their own car. Culturally, in Latin America, we associate having a car with being prosperous. It's not necessarily true. If we had very efficient public transportation here, nobody would buy a car. Why would I? If I have alternatives like the metro or bus routes, the Ara Metropolitana has worked very hard on this and we have one of the best public transportation systems, most integrated one, because we're integrating Metro with the cable cards, with the uh, public bicycles and uh, bus routes, and it reaches uh, 
everywhere in the territory. And it's beautiful because it has also improved the life of people that before took two hours to get to work. Now they have more more time in their day because they get there faster. Jorge. It is very difficult to achieve that uh, individual search in a linear world. But revolution and small things have uh, set a tendency worldwide. I want to give you an example. It's like we're kind of like guerrilla soldiers, right? Right? Yes. But these are guerrillas that are fighting to take care of the planet under this framework. I want to talk about the Overton window, which is a concept in political science that's very, very used to prevent the public or the public opinion to center its attention on systemic topics that are very popular. For example, in the next 15 years, the world will be older. Uh, more people will be old. Most of the population will be between 20 and 30 years. So most of the pol political politicians will gear their pol policy towards that bigger chunk of the population. And politicians already know about it. So the, the orientation of their public policy will be pointed at that portion of the population because they don't care about the rest of the people. What do they care about the old people that are going to be pensioners or are gonna die? So there's something very clear. I've never really talked anymore about political willingness, but about ethical commitment, uh, entrepreneurial commitment. Because willingness uh, is whether or not you want it. I believe that the efforts done by the university kids, NGOs, uh, people from the civil society are very, very, very important. In this world, uh, um, town, uh, uh, this over to window are greater, are bigger. Do we want politicians that uh, su support fracking and public policy that have uh, environmental damage. Sometimes models from Europe are not adaptable to our Latin American models because they're states of welfare. We are uh, developing uh, states that uh, wander between tyranny and uh, that doesn't mean that we don't can't have a uh, good welfare. And that's where the revolution of small things are meaningful again. I shouldn't talk about other people, but uh, I would like to say that uh, through its resilience, Medellin, in its transition from being a very violent city to being a very innovative city that constructs, uh, has forced the national Colombian government to change its environmental vision. Because we realize that in 35 years, we collapsed the development model that we have in our system. And that we're trying these three or four years that we, we've, we've had of work with this new vision to clean this uh, beautiful diamond covered in, in muck. So I would like to close with, to comment on what's happened uh, with all this social transformation that's happened in, in Brazil and this transformation is that we will take charge for that over to window to grow more every time. It is the people that are aware of the importance of the circular economic model and reducing environmental impact and to reduce, recycle, and reuse. I believe that the changes in the small things are much more successful. The most important uh, points that I, you mentioned, I would say, is, is the fact that we have alternatives to change. We don't need more dots. We already have the dots. We need to connect the dots. One thing influences the other. I would like to share with you what's happening in Brazil and what I've been working on action-wise in, 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 in the practical realm. Can you please show me slide number one? 
This is a small map where I've uh, pinned most of the important actions that I've taken since 2012. The quad plus 20, that's one of them. We talked to multiple stakeholders, getting them involved. Uh, the book, Cradle to Cradle. And then I started talking to professionals, to different uh, professional guilds, architecture or, uh, award programs based on Cradle to Cradle principles. We started talking with the government and then we started uh, diagnosing specific needs to work on production chains. Brazil is a huge country. It has the logistics and the transportation infrastructure. We know the circular economy talks about design heavily. In Brazil, we have such a huge territory. But achieving the flow that is required is difficult in Brazil because of its size. I like to say that it's not, that it is the circularity in the economy what's important. Everything should circulate flow, continuous flow, even water. If you need to separate water, that's bad. If money flows towards you, that's good. You need to move everything, and uh, nature is always moving. And now we have this idea of f funding to merit, uh, f funding associations across the continent. In Brazil, we started integrating ODS, which was a challenge for a circular economy, to be able to tackle social issues as well, if circular economy is not favoring social development. Even though new economies have to adopt circular economy, because it's the one that connects finances with the environment, very explicitly but the social element but ODSs are the way circular economy can make uh, economy more more socially what about hunger there are challenges that are beyond A city is much more than its materials, right? And now we're finally working with the government in Brazil for the first time. And now we're talking about bioeconomy. The first time that I talked about circular economy for the Ministry of Science and Technology. Bioeconomy is also very important for us. We have the Amazon. It has great stretches of coast, uh, blue economy. We have biodiversity. We also have agriculture, which also needs to be more circular and not so lineal. So bioeconomy makes sense there. Urban waste, which is more than 50% of all the waste produced. We can also transform with clean energies. And the surprise. All this work influenced the group within the Ministry of, of Territorial Integrated Development of our, com of our country's government. How can we include productively using value chain. And they started working on, so they started working on circular value chains are ways of increasing productivity inclusively to different regions of the country. So for the first time in Brazil, we saw public officials trying to actively implement techniques of circular economy with their 
so that we can all learn together to change the system. And the government became a facilitator. When I was talking to the director, when we, you don't need the government, it's better that we don't participate because we make things less efficient. So basically we're creating an ecosystem slowly We've been working for 10 years now, but it is an ecosystem that, uh, you know, now we're talking about things that in 2012 were not being mentioned. Now we're talking about sustainable ecosystem. So I, I, do, I do see that we're connecting the dots and we're getting them to talk to each other, the different stakeholders. So I'm very, very happy that we are doing things. And I see that here in Medellin and in Colombia, there are also lots of uh, connections and networking. I believe that uh, Brazil is a little bit uh, l lagging behind. Perhaps there are many initiatives that within a few years might collude and perhaps be able to achieve greater success. Mauricio, what about Mexico? What's happening over there? In Mexico, something very interesting is happening. Obviously, the most urgent priorities is our security concerns. We know that uh, our country is going through a security crisis. We have new political leadership that is betting uh, much more on refineries and fossil fuels when we already know that the world is taking a different direction. So it's it might seem that we're taking steps back, but in the last three convers in the last conversations in the last three months, is that we see that uh, industrials, um, their managers, they're all willing to bet on the circular economy, but they don't have enough mechanisms to do it. Mechanisms mean not only financial, financing implementation is not so difficult. Difficulties seem to be in the regulations. The president from Camaracero told me about it. We're classifying things as uh, waste. And once you classify things as waste, you cannot do anything with it. So it's, it's, it's not possible to create a new business model because regulations force you to take it to the landfill. You talked about OS 17. Talking about that 17, which to me is the most important everyone needs to add and start working so for the government to be a facilitator not just a regulator and a punisher the, it needs to understand where we're going what's the regulation like in mexico today we're only talking about uh, the we're talking about circular economy we're only uh, talking about the reuse of waste it's not within the logic of i'll help you i'll walk with you i'll i'll incentivate you and it's also not clear to me how i will plan a path for you forward so it's not an attitude of it's the government's fault and there's nothing else we can do but we do have to have those dots and bright spots to come up and start showing that which by nature in corporations and organizations at least in mexico because they know the benefits behind circular economy not only in terms of production they were mentioning to me that it's not about productivity but compet uh, com um, about competition if in terms of competition we do we see things then it makes sense because it means that i'm productive it means i generate uh, quality employment it means i have the capacity of subsisting over time even when competitors come from overseas with lower prices but based in a linear economy so if uh, part of the agenda we incorporate a mechanism that facilitates interaction financial mechanisms that make that effort profitable if we do research because we do need to research we need to develop new models new products it's not sufficient what we have today and we need to invest in that and if we manage for everything to be ingrained in a competitive economy then we can do the rest now for us who work in the niche of innovation 
how can we build those bridges between those who today have a development, even though at low scale, a prototype, a research, a business model, and with those large structures who have the financial and economic structures, but do not have the technical requirement today. And that bridge is simple to build. If I have a multi-Latin, multi-Latin company, and I want to develop an innovation project, how much time will I spend on it? Two, three years? And maybe I well, something comes out that does not uh, that is not applicable, and I wasted money. But if I have someone who already tested it, who already lost the money, who already validated it, I will find a path to uh, walk not to walk down a path uh, I don't need to walk uh, under. So we need to generate, and we start generating an ecosystem. It's not to see that I need to develop this and that. It's no, who are my allies who have already done it and do it with my company, but we're generating uh, research and we're generating other types of businesses taking advantage of what's already there. You were talking about the government facilitating, for example, public purchases. How do you say that? If public purchases can be done uh, publicly, and if you say, well, for example, in a couple of years, you will have uh, public purchases uh, done through bidding, for example, and there's an investment that goes for it, and there's things you will uh, get to that you, the government doesn't only need to put money, but if they see that an ecosystem is created and everything, okay, so let me ask a question. If um, if an entrepreneur sees the possibility of, of making money through a circular economy, would that be enough and to be added, or does another ingredient, is another ingredient needed to give me money because it gives me money and it also gives me this, then I'll go, I'll go all for it without thinking it. Now I think there's a limit in that uh, existential model. We cannot continue waiting for the, the entrepreneurship sector to react to what's imminently changing. I'll give you an example. There are three industries that to me have adjusted very well to circular economy. Not all. But this is where I start giving the small uh, in the indexes of revolution, small signs of revolution, the food industry. They realized that many consumers were referring to their consumption based on production model. First one impacted the, the agricultural sector and cattle. Second industry, fashion. Fashion understood the high rotation of the market. This is why Sad as owner today in the Dex, in the Dex, one of the richest in the world, understood they had to reduce the customization of clothes and in the materialization of it, but also with the possibility that those clothes be biodegradable. And an industry that is related to both is ca cannabis, industrial, bioenergetic, or uh, food. The industry of cannabis understood very well what circular cycle of production is because this plant has a circular behavioral cycle. The ethno circulation, ethno culture, which is a culturing of ethno native peoples in a region, they've been using uh, circular economy since they exist. This is new as a production model since the arrival of technologies. It is new since the arrival of technologies, the circular economy, but ancestral cultures have been always using it. So we need to continue using and developing projects where the circular economy is promoted. But there is a whole agenda being developed for naturalization of what the circular production model is all about. So efforts are being done, but we need to incentivate more that's stimulating. 
we need to incentivate with their e examples of success. When I refer to this uh, other ingredient needed for entrepreneurs to jump on board, your referenator is touching, reaching entrepreneurs with the s subject of values. We were talking at lunch and saying there's a, a, a businessman saying, okay, there's the money aspect I have, but there's an added value extra that I need. So you need to say to that businessman, okay, so in terms of values, you have grandchildren or you will have great children. So what if you leave your grandchildren with 20, 30 or 50 hectares with uh, native forests and this and that is going to the fiber of values and spirituality to see if that's an additional ingredient for people to be motivated. Yes, absolutely, Jorge. I'll close with something, but there's also a different uh, stimulation, the economy, because it's, it's, it's efficient. I think a bit differently because there's people and there's uh, uh, legal persons, entities, companies. These work in a different uh, area. I know many business people, especially the youngest, who are sons of great company people who are already working in circular economy. They want to change everything, but they know the system they're in, the company, doesn't work that way. It's not just throwing, throwing my company out the window and start from scratch. So they start doing satellite things, different things, not so central to mature the idea and influence from within. I see it as such. We need to support people who have an open mind for them to start hacking the system from within in the good sense. This is how I see it. What I do is to empower people for them to start talking uh, of circular economy from within their systems to see how they can change now. But first, they need to plan, need to be an advocate for it, talk to a lot of people, and put them in touch with each other. Because we're in a transition. Something is a fact. Circular economy is fantastic as an idea, and it makes a lot of sense. So much so that the high levels of sectors are betting towards it. It makes sense to a lot of people. Even academia, government, large and small companies. What happens though is that what we have to see is that there's a transition. We need to make it fast because time is of the essence. But it is a transition. This is why it hurts. We want everything now, but there's a mature time to mature it for people to mature in it. But I'm convinced that people are already, even those who say they don't think so, inside they actually do believe it. But what is value for a company? For me, the value is the competition to do something that's good for society. Why do we have a glass? Why don't we drink? out of our hands is much more sustainable. But with our hand, we need to be talking with our hand and it's not practical, it's not good. So we have a glass. How do we make a glass more sustainable? And more than that, you don't need to, it need, doesn't need to be less bad, but more good. It's, it needs to be more good, better, how to make the balance not less good, not more, less bad, but more good. I took an airplane, I'm here. My impact needs to be much larger than the plane I took to get here. The good impact. Otherwise, or if I'm going to make a relationship, there's no sustainability. But the rule is much more complex. Yeah, do you say the, the rule, the metric, is completely different. We need to measure different things in different ways and put people 
put people with more power to change. This is the time to change. How do I change this? How do I change that? I will then change and change and change until I look at it, it's like, whoa, we did it. I'll contribute something there. Now that I was in Mexico talking about how to get companies to see the opportunities out there, because there seems to be a language barrier. We also believe that talking about numbers in money is not enough. You need to connect it to a purpose, to values. I think that can be condensed very well from the reputation perspective. I had an uh, interesting perspective because I play in both fields, Colombia and Mexico. And I said, independent that Colombia is a smaller country and our egocentric uh, mindset that we believe we're Americans is underdeveloped, there's a lot we need to learn. There's an industrial sector, co corporate cent uh, center in Medellin that's very strong and it has joined this sustainability paradigm. And we know if we analyze them case by case, there's a lot of challenges to solve, but they overtly said that they're on board. And this is materialized through Dow Jones. There are many companies in Dow Jones today who are a select group and are being not only leaders in Colombia, but, but Dow Jones sector leaders at a global level, which means they're being profitable and being profitable through reputation because you won't tell me that all of that effort in getting on board will be to lose. No, it, will, it was done to get, gain profit and profit has been gained and will continue to be gained. So in this sort of cluster, we can call them VIP companies or however you want to call them, but uh, I hope more and more companies uh, get on board with this. But in Mexico, there's something pending from the reputation perspective, and that reputation is made because of product, um, of profitability, of competi competition, because I have alliances uh, that facilitate everything I knew and the synergies that make uh, every business be what I need it to be. So our next step as a region is to start scaling up because this is happening in large corporate groups. But 60 or 70% of companies of employment comes from uh, small and medium, medium and small businesses because we're there for a purpose and we play our lives in it and we need to be leveraged day by day. So how can we turn this into an inertia? So there's a circular economy for community development. It's like, what do you mean by that? It sounds like at a different level. We're talking industry 4.0. And when you talk about community, you imagine a small ethnic group in their own thing. And they're like, yes, but when you translate a country where 50% means 50 million uh, Mexicans living in poverty, which is more than the poverty in Colombia, and where many of those segments or marginal groups are immigrants, they're people of only women because the men left. So when you see the opportunity of the economic circular economical model as an opportunity of community growth, you can start seeing it in different scales from the ecosystem perspective. So I can have economy or bioeconomy that's a small scale in a community that they haven't had, they might not be doing it today because of a linear economy, but there's the opportunity. But if this community grows and prospers, and this one too, and this one too, and this one too, we have a government that's giving prosperity to the 50 people, 50 million Mexicans who do not have it today. So we start seeing everything in scale. Well, there is a point, government does have an important and relevant role, but there's also the power of the private company and the citizen. So for example, if we look at many answers and solutions that help facilitate the ecosystem for, econ for circular economy to be viable, it started even without there being a uh, regulation framework very good when they're there because when they're there they facilitate they are shortcut 
and they set a north to those who want to uh, get on board. But when there, there's not, that's when creative economy comes in and Latin Americans were very good at this to see what solutions we come up with, not make up solutions for a hypothetical problem, but looking at real issues of our industry, of our economy, of our society, real issues and possible solutions to improve the quality of the air. So air quality, anything we're talking about, circular economy impacts lives, generates something that generates value, something that allows us to make a sufficient use of resources or regeneration of waste. So this comes also from thinking differently. This is where we have a key role of culture, education, spaces like this one, where we can transmit a message that tells people because circular economy is so beautiful, but it's so unknown. It's a black hole. People listen to it, they know about it, but who really knows anything about black holes? Uh, a minority. Almost the same thing occurs with circular economy. When you start telling about it and you start knowing, people fall in love of the concept. They say they want to do it. They get on board. But those who have not done it is because they have not done it. The term seems so weird. They don't even understand what it is. They're like, well, this sounds good, but how do I apply this in my company? So these spaces help people, one, to know that this exists. There's a group of professionals working on this. But first of all, first of all, we need to start to communicate. There are companies who have detected the, sim the art of the simple. We want to improve the quality of life of this company, of the employees in this company. According to profiles, these charges can do telemarketing from home. I can improve the quality of life for the employee and for someone who does, who works from home is the best thing I can have because they have more time for his family. Look at the simplicity of the solution, which is powerful. The metropolitan area already does this. It's been shown that employees who work from home ha are more productive, but as Latinos who are very indisciplined, productivity is increased. How much money do they do they save in physical plant and the systemic impact because of lack of use of public transportation, energy use, it's good business. For example, Ban Colombia, who said th this is a micro city. So let's manage in this micro city of Ban Colombia Tower, uh, flexible hours, flex so they f they made schedules and shifts more flexible things that are more basic like uh, parking for parking for bikes and have, for example benefits for employees who come on bike or electrical vehicles small messages that impact in the fact that Medellin already has electric public transportation, those benefits to be generated, it would seem that those are small things and isolated things, but they're not. They're all contributing to something that is very powerful, which is changing a culture. People, for people to know that things can, can be done differently and that it does work. So telling this to the industry which is the one who generates employment and the engine of economy and how we can help them see how little by little their conventional processes can migrate from a linear model to a circular model. But I think the tough art of the simple, starting by the simple, showing what can be done what has already been solved because this inspires to go for more and people dare then to go for more. It's good, very good to hear with uh, an entrepreneur with such knowledge on circular economy because today our area with the mess plans, we want to in incentivate the uh, active 
transportation, for example, bikes, not only for health, but also to arrive safely to your work. So the different central governments in cities need to be aligned with these uh, cyclo routes, with these bike routes, for example. So with different, uh, uh, different loads, different uh, charges that are there in transportation. For example, government has a policy for every 30 days you go on bike, you have one free day for work. So different incentives. For us, the very badly used ecosystem, if we don't understand the vision, uh, the cell from micro to macro, micro to macro uh, works. If we don't understand how it works in the micro to the macro, and one cell that builds a tissue, a tissue to a muscle, we won't understand that circular economy is a natural human behavior. Our own holistic work in the body is circular. Reputation is a value, it's circular. You lose your circulation, but you can gain it again. But how long does it take you to gain it again? And I want to congratulate you because the term city, 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 but you talk about territory. He understands that this is a social network, a social weaving where everything impacts your surrounding. So starting to see this as a territory that is integrated and this facilitates and makes it easier for the government to come up with solutions that are truly effective to face the needs of its people in those ecosystems. For example, that it is respected here. I live in several cities in Colombia, but here you take care, for example, of the uh, green reservation area. So why didn't you cut this set of trees for a new road? Because that's a bird corridor, for example. Those are things the government understands how its city works. But if we had the if we had the uh, road above, why would we take it underground? Because we're generating public space in the surface for people to get in contact with the river. I'll share with you in an academic uh, scenario, there were landscapers from around the world and they said, look at the cities, large cities in the world who have cities, they talk with the river. The river is a friend in Colombia the Bogota River is not a friend. Who who has a plan to go for a picnic, for example, in the Bogota River? No one does. But large cities value and treasure their rivers as allies. In Valle do Par, for example, they love their city. In Guatapé, they're friends with their river, but they don't have to isolate the river. The river is part of our richness, part of our riches. There's the river being able to be navigated and commercial uh, connections, exclusive sectors, restaurants in Washington, for example, Washington, D.C., Paris. The soul of Paris is not the Eiffel Tower, it's the Seine River. Living with it, understanding it is very powerful. I'll go back a couple of points when we were talking about transportation, mobility, to go back to the first question, how do we do this? We talk about mobility. And we talk about a government bed saying, I'll go with a resolution where I will begin to uh, make mobility uh, something, uh, something stronger. One, because there's a physical limitation. There's a very high limitation on population growth. And we need everyone to get on board. And we need to generate a framework to bring life to this new mobility. What it happens from there on because it needs to be seen as a catalyzer. When the metropolitan area sets this commitment in the terrain where many companies, those with over 200 employees need to get on board this resolution, then a lot of new business models called startups start to rise and a mobility ecosystem of which we're part uh, starts to rise. Just like Camelback, we were born to disaggregate the uh, over concentration of employees in different companies. Today we're working with mobility, with Andy, with the entrepreneurial sectors. So we have a business line called Camel Mobility where we do integration. But within that integration, there are five or six startups that offer very specific things, infrastructure of uh, parking for bikes, 
to solutions in reducing emission They're making a reference in Spanish that is not translatable into English. You have very Colombian terms. Yes, I've been here for quite a quite a while. So I want to take it down that line. When there's an adding of wills, when there's a joining of wills and a long-term vision of specific items, you can uh, detonate different possibilities and and economic opportunities can arise how many people are working with mobility uh, i don't know we need to make a study on that but there's a new economy that is rising and if we pull that vision uh, forward 10 years and if we know that the uh, city will have its uh, mo mobilization car sector uh, doubled we don't need to be wizards to know this so when we manage to integrate mechanisms, people and companies in one same idea, I believe we can manage a growing economy and circular economy is the following step. I see that here there's an ache. That ache is that whole, we wish the mass of people knew what this is about and what i'm understanding from this is that the masses call it uh, circular economy they see something as the ever smile and i'll never get there how can we give an example as if we were talking to our five-year-old son or nephew for him to understand what that is and he may see how easy it is yeah you 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 hit on you hit the nerve here it's people people are the ones who change things so in order to put this in perspective what we're talking about here is that cities and circular economy are two engines of sustainable development right the city is where uh in brazil many countries most of the population lives in the in the world more than 50 percent and rising live in cities you have the resources you have the energy creativity innovation industry products what changes in a city changes all around and there comes a circular economy understanding that it, the process of production and consumption can change in thinking in biological cycles the metabolism circular biological and technical metabolism so understanding the metabolism of city and its chains and exploiting the idea of urban development but territorial uh, uh, urban the territories of the city the different territories uh, with humanity in that relationship this is a perspective of what we're talking about here so there there are people and there are people we need to put we need to give them a message at the right time with the right resources if we get resources close to people at the right moment where they know how to implement what they know, things change. This is what I do. I think that is the key, in my opinion. Foster the proper conditions for this to flourish. So under this perspective, I would say, we need to plan. How are we going to get the right resources to with the people, with the right message, to be able to put out there a message that calls people in, that makes them willing to invest their time, their energy, and they f fall in love. We need to plan and communicate this very well. We need to engage people. I have this entrepreneur who has told me, Alejandro, or Alex, you've opened up my mind, but I have no clue of how to implement it. And I thought to myself, how can I, right? Because here in my company, it's not possible. 
what can I offer as a service? And I don't know how, I don't know how to help you. If you want me to offer you a project, I'll do it. A project to connect with other companies, perhaps connect with my customers, or or train our design team to improve a, a different product. No, he said to me, no, please be my mentor. Take my hand and guide me. That's what I need to be able to make things happen, to be able to connect. He has the people, he has the money, he has the will, he has the system, but he doesn't really know how to make it happen. Right? The, the, the territory is so... That's what I do in Brazil. Advocating. Mobilizing resources, people. So I don't know if I'm answering properly, but... And how... What example can you give a person like that entrepreneur that you mentioned for him to understand and see how he can implement things in his company. As I mentioned, there are two ways of understanding it. There has to be inner change, like an epiphany in the person. That's absolutely important. Some of the people might need more of a rational argument, uh, figures and uh, you need to have a, the right mix. There are some people that you'll reach through their emotiveness and their emotion. They, they have a vision of the their future. You can you can you can sell them an idea of a brighter future, a, a positive future. Because we're very pessimist right now, we have uh, the burden of, of guilt to where we are. I won't be able to go out and buy anything because nothing is sustainable right now, right? So. Yeah, your disaster reality is true, but it can be different. I'm an architect, and to every single square uh, of building that I plan, I think of it as one less square meter that I steal from nature. Is circular economy asking me to change my profession entirely? I won't be able to build again because it's, it's bad? No. So, so how do we approach people? That will change. The other thing is systems. There are m many cases uh, that we could talk about. We can talk about technological, entrepreneurial systems, in our political systems, or the infrastructure in the city, innovation systems. These are all systems. They're a bit more technical. And by tapping human creativity, which is limitless, Jorge, I would like to help Alex, to talk about circular economy for dummies as well. One of the biggest lessons in this three, four years working with the metropolitan area is that circular economy first is based on reduction of waste and reduction of products. We need to be able to stop basing our emerging economies, Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil, in commodities and raw materials. Startup models are successful because they're not based in mining or commodities, and they transform it. So stop accumulating capital and stop producing waste. The second key of circular economy is the cycling or the reuse of a well-designed product. We cannot keep product, producing products for one use. This glass could also be recycled. And the third pillar of circular economy is also recovering or reducing time. Less, less space, less resources in oxygen, air, water, soil. And more time to enjoy for the product. More time to spend with your, with your family. More time for leisure and happiness less time investing your energy to pay debt. The linear model is the one that leveraged the credit system of the banking world. Accumulate, accumulate, and uh, both death and capital, and I become a slave of my debt, becoming, making it into a vicious cycle. Now, my executive summary of what a 
circular economy is is that first of all, it's an economic model. If we're going to talk about circular economy, it's an economic model that works, that enables free development of the industry, that adds value and creates job opportunity. It's an economic model that promotes, first of all, not to just look uh, at the carbon footprint of materials or the businesses. It calls for us to make an analysis of, of products and their life cycle. What will happen with this book note? once it fulfills its life cycle. So from the very design of the product, before it becomes waste, figure it out, turn it around. How are you, how can you reuse it? How can you repair it? How can you re, uh, refurbish it? If I can get it back into a cycle of use before I destine it as a, as a residue, as waste, when eventually it gets there to be waste, what kind of waste will it be? Will it be like uh, polypropylene that needs uh, more than 500 years to biodegrade in nature? Or will it be a residue or a waste like wood that can be incorporated safely into nature? So if we're talking about sustainability, we need to look at the, the sourcing of, of the things that we own. Are we gonna keep investing on products from China besides the footprint it has a social impact. It's displacing local um, products. And circular economy also considers the social aspect, the welfare of citizens. So circular economy also touches on those aspects. It also looks at energy. It also fosters the use of renewable energies and clean energies trying to use resources of low impact. So if I'm a business person and I have this business and I'm analyzing and I get my team, uh, my work team, if I as a, as a leader in the company, as a manager, I get my work team to redesign products, it becomes a reality. I love, I'm passionate about this, this topic. So I see the Toto is come out with a line of products made up of uh, recycled sourced materials. They show to, to, to the company and uh, the civil society that they're committed with the environment. And that adds value to the, to the client. If I want to buy a backpack and this one is made up of you know, animal fur and this one is made up of safe materials that are safe, People are even willing to pay more because this is sustainable. I'm supporting sustainability. But if from within the company you offer products that are with that have circular components, you might even be able to cost the same as many others. So that cost is not an argument for you to make the choice. So I help people to change their consumption habits. So this is a multidimensional problem. We need to think about how the consumer thinks, how the, our institutions work. But most of all, circular economy is about how can we survive on this earth, consuming resources, but in a much more efficient way, in a much more friendly way with the environment, in a way that lessens the impact of economy on the environment impacting positively also uh, nature. This event is not only carbon neutral, we're trying to have a negative carbon footprint. It's going to offset negatively in a way. It's going to be more good, not just less bad. I've participated in many sustainability lectures and I always close with echo tips. These are practices that helped us uh, migrate from a linear, linear model to a circular model. For example, close the faucet when you're cleaning your teeth. Turn off the lights uh, of the rooms in your house that you're not using. Try not to print on paper if you can help it. And if you do print, use both faces of the page. Hopefully you should use papers that are sourced from renewable materials. These are so such a simple changes that taken massively across a population have a big impact. 
I'm not going to use my car today. Today I'm going to walk or I'm going to try to use the bicycle system. Every single step and decision adds up and the power of the simple choices that you make eventually has a huge impact. These are simple circular economy concepts. If you're at a coffee shop and you have an option to the disposable cup, use it. If you're going to buy a beverage and you opt for the glass option instead of the plastic option, that signals the company that you prefer that. That's when companies that used to prefer plastic go back to glass. So the consumer eventually takes the choice of change. Government is not the only one responsible for change. We as consumers have a very important power to foster the responsible use of resources, and they're all related to circular economy and its practices. I would, I would like to address those that are interested in getting involved in circular economy. Today we're in the, let's say, the second wave of trendiness in this circular economy. I remember back then when circular economy was was not very significant. I myself started with cradle to cradle. That was the first circular principle that I that I heard. And then the Ellen MacArthur Foundation um, started promoting this whole thing, and uh, through them I understood it a little bit better. Now we're in the, on the second wave understanding, where we we already understand a little bit, and how can we implement, and how can we learn from people that already did it in the past because I know lots of like implementation um, try um, and I know about many studies in many different cities so we need to yes definitely nurture ourselves from the insights of people that have already tried it so once you're there and you're committed to the circular economy you need to choose a guiding principle or a direction we're at a time where we need people to take action. So circular economy are, includes three big systems, production systems, flow systems, energy systems, renewable energy systems. So we need to flow, to go and come back. It's part of consumption, it's part of production. Of course, I'm simplifying it greatly, but that's enough to start. And you have these three big areas, the area of action. If you're an entrepreneur or a businessman, an innovator, somebody who wants to try something out by himself, you're going to try to create something in the real world. This is the people that are acting. The ones, you also have the ones uh, providing education, understanding uh, community problems, how to understand uh, the product, the problems products make. In this area, you, you, you will talk to a lot of people and teach a lot of people how to use this tool. And also you have the planning item. That's where I work. So action, education, and planning. So how have I done this? I'm not very good at planning uh, big projects. I found somebody that understands what I wanted to learn. Exomata Miki is the one who helps me with the strategic uh, vision of many stakeholders and how they connect and interact. So with my small knowledge of circular economy, I get to implement it planning, planning ecosystems, planning actions. How can we, how to understand it, uh, fighting forces, the ones that are in favor and against, where can the, we source the resources from and within which time frames and so the, the message that I want to leave you with is that you can do things in many different areas, action, education and planning. Right now, we have lots of idealists that stay in the idea. The moment is not ripe yet for, for action, perhaps. Right? There's many people waiting for products to come out so they can support it, right? At that point, I'll buy it. I'll prefer it. No. It is, the time is ripe 
for those that want something new. Let me try it. Let me try something new. I want to I want to pitch in. And that's where that's where I work. I help these people that want to take action to plan and to learn from the insights of the past. Within this context, we need to recognize that we're in a globalized world, very competitive. Here in Latin America, we're emerging economies. We don't really develop technologies. There's lots of countries that are much better in it. So another argument that really helps to raise awareness in business about the need for transitioning into a circular economy is just to look at industrial revolutions. Each one was closer to the, to the previous one. The time that it takes to go from one to the next, we're in the fourth industrial revolution and we already see in the near future the fifth. So who doesn't evolve will lose com 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 competitiveness in a global market. So we'll repeat the, the time when Colombia went into, uh, be became a, a country with uh, open trade agreements and we weren't ready for it and we actually harmed the economy. So if we understand that there are lots of countries that are migrating into a circular economy, we need to, we will understand that we need to act now, immediately. We need to get on the wagon, the wagon of circular economy to be able to stay competitive in the globalized world. Because in the free trade agreements, they will start looking at different conditions and perhaps circularity will be a requirement. I would like to add something. There are many places around the world, communities and countries, that didn't really ripe any benefits from the linear economy. They didn't achieve infrastructure, education, security. They didn't really develop their societies through this business model. And perhaps with this new circular economy model, they have a chance because they can consider different ideas and go into a different flow than the linear model offers. So I'm talking to the future leaders of the region to embrace the idea of circular economy, to achieve those things that are perhaps not that easy to, to achieve in the linear model, not to strengthen the same old paradigms. So when you talk about Medellin, I see that there are lots of new things happening here. There are many options where it, perhaps you cannot add too much value with the linear system, but with new systems, you might. So this is definitely not for someone who is stuck in the old vision and, and the old model. This is uh, an open call for future leaders to get into the wagon. Jorge, I would say that uh, in closing, given that we're running out of time, I'd like to thank Alex, Mario, Jorge. I'm admired with all, all the knowledge that you've shown here. The Ada Metropolitana tries to outreach, to create networking, to understand best practices and lessons learned, to promote the a business system so that they feel our support. We also want to see uh, circular economy as an opportunity of change in the world so that it doesn't stay in the ideas and uh, the dialogue, but uh, transforms itself into offers that answer the demand. We also need to keep you fostering these spaces. Each one can become virtual so they uh, have better outreach. Also, we want to help Kevin de Cuba and Kevin Aston. We want to invite you to make two invitations. In 4th November, we're going to have the Metropolitan Encounter of Circular and Creative Economy. We're going to create the Metropolitan Committee of Circular Economy because we want to integrate those two transformation economies here in the Valley of Aurora in the framework of the Fourth Revolution. We want to show the interface that today exists between innovation, technology, and culture. And this innovation is allowing us to have multidisciplinary economies with a holistic approach that 
makes bubble, different changes of paradigm, new job offers, and different uh, social practices. We've had very terrible practices for 300 years that has brought us to this modern society. It's very difficult to change the status quo of the system, but it is possible. Medellin has moved from being in the 1990s one of the most violent cities in the world to be now a world reference in innovation and we're taking great steps this is the era of knowledge transformation so thank you very much so complementing what he says Medellin moved from being the worst the most violent city in the world and now it's seen as an innovative city do you know how it achieved it every time violence peaked they created a, a cultural secretariat. In the 90s, they created a cultural secretariat, another one, another one. That's how we managed to cut the curve. So, so homicides have dropped dramatically. They should be zero in every, in every city of the world. But definitely, this is thinking about um, this, the citizens and this is social benefit. And thanks to that beautiful work that the government has done in Medellin, for more than 20 years now. We have been able to transform the city that way. We already see the results. And right now, we, we're presenting the government results of this four-year government period. There are many things that we're going to touch there. Um, we're gonna talk about teleworking, 2020 project, there are many, many other things that we'll present there. We have about five minutes to wrap up. Hopefully four, because I need to make some announcements. I would just like to thank you. You two spoke about great things, and uh, Brazil is going through a very difficult, a very crucial moment, which is we're choosing the development model that uh, that we're going to commit with and you have a development model here that came from a very critical situation of violence and you've transformed the city and done very beautiful things so i'm very interested in understanding very very well what is what has happened in medellin i know that it's not possible to do it right here as part of the conversation but uh, perhaps later today so i want to bring your experience closer to the people in Brazil so that we can learn. Yeah, definitely, that's our that's our work. So I would like to use Santiago's words to also thank everybody for letting us uh, be part of this space. I would also like to thank everyone. I would like to leave two elements in the table. I, uh, I know that we already mentioned them, but without these specific words, one is to build learning networks because from each of our contexts, we can teach others those educational networks can be between people and between organizations and even between cities and the second thing is that we need to start seeing ourselves uh, from within the cooperative economy because we're talking about new business models many of them disruptives new designs new ways of cons consumption or purchasing and if we want to impact uh, um, the the consumer which is the one that really defines the production uh, decisions or the other way around, because this is like the problem of the egg and, and, the, and the chicken. We need to start involving people from the marketing departments of of every single entity. And I just don't refer to market product marketing. I, I refer to communication as well, because if from each one of our niches, we are able to communicate what uh, circular economy is, we'll be able to unite our efforts. If we can show that circular economy has lots of tools um, that can help every single one, will make transformations that are great. Job creation, better use of materials, innovation and better use of technology. So my announcement is this. I'm sure that everyone who's looking at us over the internet and who will see us later will be wondering how can they pitch in? How can they uh, Learn, how can they learn a little bit more? To all of those that are wondering how they can train themselves, they can go to the ASDF. You can see here in front of your screen, www.asdf.com. There you will be able to continue your learning. And in this foundation, you'll find 
Mauricio, there you'll find Alex, and there you'll find Kevin, and you'll find many leaders and the, the top 50 experts of circular economy around the world or their organizations. So for any business venture or any project that you might assistance with, so I invite every single one of you to log onto the page and get informed, get on the wagon. Thank you very much everyone for this two hours and thanks to the audience for paying attention to this very wonderful, interesting conversation. And thank you for helping me understand a little bit more what circular economy is all about with your own insights and experience.